All right. Good evening. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen. Um, on behalf of Tarn School of Taiwanese American Center of Northern California, welcome to our Sustainable Living Series. For people who are first time uh, attending our Sustainable Series, Taiwan Center and Taiwan School have served the community for more than 17 years. We believe a variety, we deliver a variety of uh, enrichment classes for everyone. During weekdays, seniors enjoy wellness programs of uh, physical activities, cultural, musical, te and technology classes in our 8,000 square feet facility in San Jose. And during weekends, Taiwan School has used this facility to create an environment for kids to learn and appreciate Taiwanese culture and languages. Although we had to temporarily close our facility due to the pandemic, our programs to serve and reach out to our community at large never stopped. This has been a hard year for everyone, but we believe a strong community staying connected will ensure a sustainable future. Thank you all for showing your support by attending tonight's event. Today, we are very honored to have Claire Hong as our speaker. She started from stirring the healing herbs into her handmade soaps before her passion in home herbalism and herbal medicines led her to establish Claire's Handmade Soap and Claire's Aroma Therapy Studio, as well as writing two popular books in Taiwan on soap and herbalism. Claire is also working on a third book that is getting published soon. With her psychology background, Claire believes the healing power from nature will also heal our heart through the process. We look forward to her presentation today. Um, Patty, next slide. Our moderator today will be Ting Chen. She studied natural, natural resource reservation and botany in college and grad school. She founded the Environment Empowerment Program in the Society of Wilderness Xinju branch in Taiwan. She loves nature and has devoted herself to be an earth advocate since she was little. Her conversation with Claire today will surely be very insightful. So um, before I turn the stage to Claire, just a reminder that if you have any questions, please use the chat box to submit them. Thank you. Let's welcome Claire. Right. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, so I, my name is Claire, and I make soap, and I love our herbs. So let me get to my slide sharing. Uh, okay, so slides showing up, okay? Yes. Okay. All right, so, um, okay, so it's showtime for me. I'm a little bit nervous, I have to admit, um, because this is my first time doing an online talk like this uh, without talking to a real person in front of me. So um, let's see, uh, hope I do a good job. Uh, it, this is the two books that, that Jen mentioned that I published in Taiwan, they're in Mandarin. Uh, I guess if you read the, the Chinese, the Mandarin, you can see that I call myself a witch. Okay, uh, you might be wondering like, why a witch? Okay, so if you look at stirring, like soap, if you know soap making, when you stir a big pot, pot of soap, you add all kinds of powder, essential oils inside, it kind of looks like a witch stirring a pot, right? But this is the type of witch that I like consider myself to be is that um, that when you study herbalism in the Western herbalism point of view, we often say that we're studying the uh, mapping between the natural world and the human body. And it's easier to explain with the Mandarin character, Wu, which means witch or medium. Okay, over here is what medium or channel. If you look at this um, Mandarin character, there's a top line that signifies heaven, 
the bottom line signifies the earth and there is a middle vertical line that represents the medium that connects the heaven above and the earth below. So medium in this case, meaning that you are connecting, you are mapping the above and the below, and you are also, this character, these three straight lines represents the uh, in Mandarin, the character work, 工作, work. So you're working with who? With people. This is one person, two person representing people. So I guess in that sense that you can say that the channel or the medium, i.e. the witch, me, connects the heaven above and the earth below and people surrounding me. So what I'm trying to say is that I am a witch that's trying to connect um, with plants. Okay, because I study herbalism. And my kids know this about me. I'm always distracted by nature. Um, when we go take a, like a, on the weekends, go take a walk or a hike on the hills, they know to stop every three to five minutes or so to wait up for mommy. Um, and chances are I would be distracted by a, an interesting plant or beautiful blossom by the side of the tracks. And I'll be taking pictures. I will try to decide whether I can pick this up and take home with me, or I should just take a picture to go home with. Okay. So, so the, enough about me. Let's just um, jump right into today's uh, subject, uh, which I titled self care with aromatics. So you can tell from this, the, so far I've been talking about plants and I'm talking, I'm going to be talking about aromatics. I'm talking about things that smells nice that comes from plants. Okay, and uh, how do I start this one? I guess I should say we're using plants to help us with what? Okay, we're, okay, people get sick. And I guess if you make the analogy of the uh, pathogen as enemy, our body's immune system is like the defense system, or you can call it, it's often make, we often make the analogy of the firefighter or the army of our body. So if you read the text on my slide, excuse me, I need to move this out. Okay. I have, I have, my view is being uh, blocked and I cannot move it out of the way. Here, got it. Okay. So the immune system is a network of biological processes that protects an organism from diseases. It detects and responds to a wide range of variety of pathogens from viruses, parasites, as well as cancer cells or objects such as, you know, you might get it with splinter in your finger and your body will go turn red and swollen. That's your uh, inflammation response, which is your immune system at work. Okay, so essentially your immune system is working on distinguishing the foreign objects, the pathogens or just you know any unwelcome things inside your body from your your organism's own healthy tissue okay um so let's go next slide what are the pathogens that can make us sick um this also you can find online or any medical textbook will show you there are major types of four major types of pathogen uh, First one, the bacteria can be caused, can cause um, disease like strep throat, uh, staph infections, tuberculosis, food poisoning, or pneumonia. Okay. The next one is viruses. It can cause such, you know, cold and flu, herpes, measles, and smallpox. And you can hear from my sound right now. My voice is slightly nasally because I've been, I have this nasty flu for a week so far, okay, over a week. And sometimes the virus can be really, really hard to beat back. Okay, number three is fungi. Well, I don't know if we pronounce it as fungi. Uh, it's a simple organism, which you know you can see from the picture, it looks like a mushroom. Basically, it's like um, the mold or yeast that grows in the bathroom that could get you sick too. Okay, um, in human body, another common disease caused by the, the, the fungi would be the athlete's foot. foot which means you have some kind of mold growing in your shoes or in your toenails. All right, the fourth one is called protozoa. It's a single cell organism with, a, it, it has, it's really simple. So it's like one cell with the nucleus 
and it's most commonly we the the most common disease that we know caused by protozoa would be malaria or when you go travel um you encounter some unclean water you may get so-called traveler's diarrhea okay so these are the main four major groups of pathogens that can make us sick so um next i want to bring your attention to the current pandemic we all know by now that um you know the world is being threatened by this um sars cov2 virus uh which caused the disease called COVID 19. um so the culprit uh, sars cov2 virus uh, don't be intimidated by this seemingly um, complicated medical jargon. What I want to present to you is just this picture in this picture, the structure of the virus. You can see that it has a membrane that envelops the RNA viral infection inside of the virus. And embedded in this membrane are different types of proteins that um, the spike protein number one is in charge of locking the virus onto your healthy tissue once the virus enters your body and starts breaking open this membrane and release the viral information into your healthy tissue the healthy cells and starts replicating itself and makes you get sick Okay, and there's other proteins which we're going to ignore for the purpose of this presentation. I'm only going to tell you what I want you to look at. Is this is this uh, membrane. This membrane is consists of um, uh, essentially a fatty two layers of um, fatty the, the tissues that the sorry not tissue uh, structures that contains fat in it. Okay, so. This is by there. You can see there are different color. I'm just going to make simplify the structure so that it's easier for us to comprehend that this is the oily, kind of an oily wall of the virus. And if it's oily, you know what we do to oily things? We use soap to wash it out, right? So why does soap work in destroying the virus? Like I said, the membrane, this is another different illustration of the virus. This is the membrane. These are the spike proteins that will lock onto your ACE2 receptor in your body. Um, and these are, we call them surfactant molecules, or you just call them soap. All the cleaning agent, all the um, cleaning solutions, your dish, dish um, detergent, your body soap, your laundry detergent, all share this similar structure that has um, a hydrophilic, which is a water loving head and a water hating tail okay and this water hating tail actually the the making if you make soap you would know that you mix oil with lye to make soap and where does the fatty part the fatty tail the water the, sorry, the oil loving tail obviously comes from the oil you put in to your soap right so this um water hating oil loving tail would like to connect with another friend that is also fatty or actually in this case somewhat waxy that's the virus's uh, membrane that's uh, uh, we call it the lipid bilayer envelope so once it's connected and because you wash your hands with soap and water the water loving head will connect to the water and pull the membrane apart thus by washing our hands we are actually breaking open the membrane of the virus and once the membrane is open the viral information will get released into the water and wash down the drain as opposed to going into your body so that's how you know, we know so washing hands just works okay and <clears throat> the next one i'm going to show you a uh, data i pulled from the taiwan cdc site uh, of course, we all know. I should I should explain that uh, we all get sick. Uh, if we if we get sick, sometimes it's actually from, especially in terms of virus, um, when it's it's when um, a sick person, an infected person, 
coughs, sneezes, or when they're talking, they spit out the small, tiny, small particles, or we call them droplets, into the air. And you happen to walk by, or you have been talking to this person for a certain amount of time, and you breathe in these tiny particles without knowing it. And those particles carry the virus, and that's how the virus enters when they get you infected by these viruses, how they enter your body, through your nose and your, and your mouth. Well, you could be touching a surface that has the virus on it, and you, 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 you um, accidentally, um, I don't know, pick your nose, uh, rub your eyes, and that the virus enter your membrane through that route as well. So, uh, since the pandemic, uh, broke out, we know that in Taiwan, we have been told um, to wear masks and don't stop washing your hands. Every time you go out, you come back home, you always wash your hands. And let me explain this chart to you. This is, uh, as you see, the title is nationwide. This is Taiwan, of course, confirmed severe flu cases because we don't, we, we, we lock down our border really early. So we don't really have too many, uh, COVID-19 cases, but we can use this severe flu cases as an example. The red bars here, you can see, okay, sorry, the X axis here is, you can see 2019 40th week, 2019 43rd week. Okay, so this is end of 2019. And this is data on flu, right? So we know flu is seasonal. It comes uh, into peak season starting in the fall. And in Taiwan, it usually, usually peaks up well into winter. You can see the red bar are the confirmed uh, red, uh, uh, sorry, confirmed severe flu cases. So by 2019, the end um, uh, 2019, 52, 52nd week, that's meaning that's like Christmas and New Year's of 2019 um, and <clears throat> into 2020. Um, the case is at its highest, and you might notice the green bars, it says excluded. That is, um, there are some cases that you suspected to be caused by flu, but their severe symptom later got ruled out. Okay, so ignore the green part. Just look at the red. Okay, the flu cases. So, we know that in Taiwan, we started lock on, lock, sorry, lock down the border, and we start to be told to wash our hands and wear a mask after the Lunar New Year, and school was postponed for two weeks. So by the time school starts, everybody is already well educated to be doing these things. Wear, wear your mask, wash your hands. Um, you can see the severe flu cases by the week six, the sixth week, which is mid-February, or you know somewhere into the end of February, it just dropped to non-existent. No severe flu cases ever since. And if I remember Korea now, the data shows up all the way up to the 10th week. This is about um, early March. I think there's maybe a couple one here during late March. We're now in mid-April, but you can see how effective this has helped. And it's certainly not helping with the business for the health clinics around here, but you know, good for us. We don't get sick as often. Well, we get sick, but not going into severe uh, symptoms. Okay, so how can nature help? This is the main topic that those, what I've just uh, presented so far is the background information of why we want to turn to plants for help. Okay. Um, um, it's been known that essential oil is um, helpful in terms of um, beating back anti uh, sorry, beating back viruses, bacteria, or, you know, different types of pathogens. And what is essential oil? Essential oils is distilled from medicinal plants. So they have some types of medicinal properties. And I cannot go into details of the entire theory and practice of aromatherapy since I only have um, less than an hour, which I'm actually trying to speed up. Okay, uh, the essential oil can help. I'm going to present you with two review papers. And you can, at a glance, see quickly here that essential oil exhibits significant, for example, antimicrobial activity 
it inhibits growth of drug resistant microbes, which is like, you know, MRSA, which in the hospital is a big problem. So, um, number three, essential oils also lead to cell wall rupture, which is breaking the, the, the cell wall of the, the pathogen. And it can also lead, uh, help uh, lead to the leakage of the cellular component, which is the, the viral information inside the virus, right? It, the, like I was saying, like explaining that it will break open the membrane and uh, release the viral information. Uh, number five, essential oil also interfere with electron transport system, medical jargon, but let me put it in the simple, maybe not so great, but you get the idea analogy. That is kind of like you are getting, you got a virus, it needs to tra travel from point A to point B on the highway. And the transport system is that you basically break their highway or their vehicle, right? So hence you break the bacteria. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this second paper is more focused on antiviral properties of essential oil. So number one, that several many published studies report significant antiviral effects of essential oils. I'm not saying which cures what or which kills what. I'm just saying in general, essential oil has been proven to help. Okay, number two, it causes capsid disintegration. Also, again, ignore the jargon that you don't know. If you are interested, you can, after the, the talk, you can go look it up. It's actually a lot of fun. I enjoy doing this very much. Um, so basically, you just look at the keyword. It disintegrates. It makes the virus ineffective. And it inhibits blah, blah. Don't know how to pronounce it. Doesn't matter. It says it's the membrane protein. So it breaks the structure of certain viruses. Okay. Number four. It can destabilize certain viruses also and the structure, the certain parts of the of certain viruses that is essential for the viral replication. So we stop the uh, virus from its track. Okay. Okay, number five. I think someone needs to mute their mic. I'm sorry. Okay, number five. Uh, so, like I said, the essential oil is lipid uh, loving. So, it can penetrate the viral membranes. Like I said, viral membranes are made with all, uh, fat molecules. So, we can disrupt the membrane by applying essential oil to your disinfectant spray. Um, so, I'm going to focus today's presentation on two herbs that I have found since the pandemic broke out to be helpful or uh, when I really don't really encounter the virus because I live in Taiwan, but we're trying to be very, very careful. So, I follow all the herbalist studies on how we can, what we can do to help. So, ignore all the bottom studies on this slide. I want to uh, get your attention to look at some lab studies on essential oils antiviral properties. Number one is this 2008. This study, they look at several essential oils and they have found that um, after SARS, okay, SARS was 2003 and this is 2008. So, bail oral can really help. Okay, and this is the study. I think I'm running a little bit short of time. I'm going to leave you. Uh, later out, this link will be put online. You can read the details, but basically we know that this study, the researchers looked at several essential oils to evaluate their um, uh, ability to stop the virus from replicating. And we found out that um, bay laurel is really helpful. Bay laurel, what's bay laurel? I have bay laurel here in my, okay, later we're gonna, when we do the, the the DIY section, I will show you the leaves. And you can see on the slide, I said, uh, yes, I'm the leaf that you find in your soup. Yes, you have it in your pantry. Okay, the bay leaf has a lot of wonderful properties. Again, I'm not gonna spend time reading through these bullet points. You can, after the talk, grab the slide file and study. So we know that bay leaf has the potential of deterring the uh, coronavirus. The another herb that I want to show you is oregano. Also, this is a very common um, 
kitchen herb. You have it in your pantry too. If you have Italian seasoning, I don't know if you can see this. I'll show you when I have the big screen. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, the oregano has a bunch of wonderful antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal, etc. Um, um, properties. And notice I use in red fonts. I would like you to read this if you should you have a bottle of oregano essential oil at home. Do read the the fine print, I guess. But don't be scared by the when I say toxicity, I just want you to be very careful. Use very small dose when you use essential oil and always dilute. But using oregano in your tea or infused honey, which we're going to make in a second, or just sprinkle them on your pizza is totally safe. Okay, so that's oregano. And why do I bring out oregano? Because I found a study. Again, it's in vitro. I mean, in vitro is done in a petri dish. It's a glass dish uh, in a lab. But it did show that the essential oil of oregano can destroy the SARS coronavirus and stop its replication within 20 minutes of exposure. And in this, all these studies are in down in the lab. It might seem a lot, but we're at the, this you know day and age where we actually are really unsure about how to um, not get the virus. Um, so anything can help. And we already know that all these effort that we put in can stop you, you know, getting flu or cold or stop you from getting this bad case of it, right? So um, that's why I would um, choose some herbs to uh, incorporate them into my day to day, either making a hand sanitizer, making honey to eat it. So inside my body, I create an unfriendly environment for the virus or you know any pathogens. Okay, now I'm gonna uh, exit the uh, presentation. I'm gonna show you how to make uh, a hand sanitizer and herbal honey, and which I think we already put out. If you sign up for this, you have the handout in your hand. I am, okay, so I'm back with full screen. I'm gonna show you how to make uh, excuse me. How to make a hand sanitizer spray? If you have a bottle of essential oil, say I have bay laurel here, and okay, let me get my hand out. In my hand out, I said you want to use six drops of bay laurel or oregano essential oil. So you want to have all your material ready before you start doing this. Uh, but okay, this is a 30 millimeter bottle. I have a bottle of Bay Laurel essential oil. I'm gonna take this bottle and turn it around. I'm gonna drop six drops into the bottle. One, two, three, four, five, six, really fast. Okay, seven, one extra drop is fine. And then, I'm going to take my alcohol. This is rubbing alcohol, 75% known to the concentration. It's not 99% is not better. 75% is best in penetrating the, the virus or, you know, or the bacteria cell wall. And if you are not confident in pouring directly into your spray bottle, get a small measuring cup, fill it up to about a bit less than 30 mill that's your alcohol so i have essential oil in here so it's basically i'm, I'm what i'm do, trying to do is i'm boosting the ability of the alcohol in preventing and killing actually breaking the virus membrane so i pour that in and voila actually that's that's done easy then you cap it and I would strongly recommend that you label it because if you are an herbalist, which like me, I have, I don't know, 2000 bottles at home. I need to know what bottle is what, you know, two months from now, I might not forget. So don't trust your brain so much. So my cute, like, you know, I am the, you know, basic kind of witch. I like my brown label. You can find like beautiful printed floral patterns. This is handmade label, make your own, print your own. 
I believe in the US you have actually online services to print labels for you. So just write down your ingredients, what it's for. Also in case that, you know, your kids might take them and use for some inappropriate purposes of what I know. So then, you know, label your, your, your spray. And I also recommend that you make a small bottle instead of a big one every time. You want to use it as fast as possible. So just drop and make 10 each time. Put it in your bag, put it in your coat pocket, put it in your kid's school bag. So they know that if they're out and about, they need to eat some food when they've been running around outside and there's no place to wash their hands, you have your spray. And in the handout, I also provided you with a way to make tincture. Um, tincture, I have a ready-made one. This is, this is not bay, I'm sorry. This is, uh, what did I use in here? This is sage, my sage tincture, white sage. This is my witchy tincture. <laughs> okay, and making tincture is also really easy. Tincture, like I said, in the handout, you can probably see, you have herbs. This is the bay leaf I just harvested and washed and dried this morning. This is my, I have a bay plant. So I will just pick it out like this and dry it and I will use it in my cooking. And sometimes I'll make it in my, into tincture like this. And to make tincture, also easy, get a pair of scissors and find a jar that you are making the tincture with. Okay, I'm gonna, all right, can't quite see it, let me. All right, so I'm cutting it into tiny small pieces into the jar. I'm gonna just stop here because of our time restraint. So this is the tiny bits of your Cut them as small as possible. If you want to grind them, that's fine. Probably even better because that means the extraction rate is higher. Okay, so put it in and then preferably you want to fill it up, but sometimes depending on how, your production rate, right? How much, how much herb you have. You can, if you don't grow plants, you can go buy them from herb supplies uh, or actually uh, supermarket sometimes has a, a, a whole bunch of uh, herbs that you can purchase as well and then you just pour it, uh, this is alcohol, I'm sorry. Pour alcohol to cover. I usually don't really measure. People ask me about this all the time. How much was the, is the ratio um, of your, your plant to alcohol? I just say cover. Uh, and then another thing I want to add is if you don't have fresh, like I am a, a plant loving witch, you can buy, this is my container. I don't think you can read that, that's fine. But this you will recognize, this is store-bought bay leaves. Okay, buy these and again, chop them up. Put them into your tincture fresh, just to make sure there's no raw water. If it's water content from the plant leaf itself, that's fine. Okay, that's it. That's how you make tincture. And when you made your own tincture, you have it made, you want to shake it a little bit every day and you put it by the windowsill where it gets some sun every say afternoon, four to six hours. So it gets the heat will facilitate the extraction. And after two weeks, four weeks, sometimes I forget about it. <laughs> I waited two weeks, but that also does not matter. Like this one, I'm gonna show you, you can you can see how the the color is kind of greenish brown or oh, brownish green, you call it. Um, and then I filter. I filter out the leaf. I then then I have say this one later in two weeks. I will have bay leaf tincture. I just filter that and then I I, I pour again. Find a spray bottle. Pour the filtered alcohol. That's the tincture into this. There's your bay laurel tincture disinfectant spray. So also very easy. So that's that's how you make disinfectant spray with plant matter and they smell really really nice <clears throat> the next one i'm going to make for you is herbal honey and this is very tasty i have to tell you i have one made this is uh mixed herbs i have all kinds because i grow all, all kinds of herbs at home um 
Uh, so this is a combination and they all have their different medicinal property. Just pick one that you think would taste good or you like the smell and put them in your honey. Then after you're done, you can put them in your tea. So this is how you make um, herbal honey. You find at the end another jar and say I'm making, let me change it up. I'm making, again, this is my harvest this morning. This is um, fresh, washed and dried oregano. Fresh is fine, but if you can find store-bought uh, dried oregano leaves, that works too. So you just, I will usually just, usually I do this on a, a cutting board. I just, you know, chop the heck out of it. Okay, if I don't have it right now, I would chop it with the kitchen shear because the stem may be a little bit rough. So, chop them up, put inside the jar. Again, I'm not going to do it the whole way. Um, for demonstration purpose, you get the idea. Chop up your the herb that you harvest or you 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 purchased from the uh, the herb supply store or your own garden or uh, sorry uh, or Safeway for example. So this is the herb inside the jar, and then find your honey for convenient purpose because I have a huge jug of honey at home. Okay, this is the Taiwanese. Uh, bottle of honey, but you, you probably want to pour it out um, into a measuring cup and then you pour it over to cover your herbs inside. All right, and usually you pack more herbs than what I just did because I put the nutrition person only put a little bit, usually it's more. And because you put more, there will be air bubbles inside you want to take a, sorry, I don't have a, a stirring rod or just your, your fork. Take a fork and just stir to make the air bubble flow to the top. It will come out and then you cap it. Because in, in this case, if once the air bubble all flows to the top, you might find that you do not have enough honey. So you want to add a little bit more honey to make sure all the herbs are submerged in the honey. And then you cap it. All right, and like I said, this one I already made. I'm going to use this one to demonstrate. Um, it takes a while for the flavor to go into the honey. So, and you want to make sure that they are all submerged. And this one, I feel the other way out. You can, I don't know if you can tell in the bottom, they are floating a little bit to the top. So what I do is I put it by the kitchen counter or by a window where I can see every day. And then when I walk by every day, I flip it. But I don't, I want to make sure that I don't make a mess. I, I find a small dish when I flip it in, in case it flows out of your bottle. Okay, so put it like that and you see that the honey will slowly seep down. If there's air at the bottom, it will float to the top. And then the next day or in by the, you know, in the morning, you flip it once in the afternoon when you come back from work, you flip it again. So again, after two weeks, four weeks, depending on what, what you feel like, um, timing is not that big of a deal, but don't let it sit there for like six, six months. You might find mold in there. All right. So maybe just let this just say two months, make sure that you drain it out and then you get awesome herbal honey. And how do you use it? You take a small spoon every day in the morning. I take a spoon or when I'm sick right now, for example, actually I have, I have another jar, which is like down to the bottom. I'm not going to show you. I've been eating the honey every day to soothe my throat that has the herbs infused inside. Um, you can put add it to your tea or, you know, come summertime, you like to do barbecue, you marinate your meat. Sometimes you in the marinade, along with all the other spices, you might want to add honey, honey roasted ribs. For example, this is your, your, you can, can be your go to honey. Okay. So that's my um, presentation on how to make these simple homemade aromatic um, little things to help your life um, live a healthier and happier and fragrant life, I guess. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire, for bringing us this informati informative talk. I over time. <laughs> so now, 
we know that essential oils have strong power to kill pathogens. And we also learned how to make herbal hand sanitizer and herb, herb honey by ourselves. But as a beginner, I have no idea what are the right. brands I can trust. And so could you recommend some essential oil brands uh, with good quality and also we can easily find in the United States or in the Bay Area? So I think it would be helpful for beginners. Excellent. Uh, I think I included it. Wait, where's my handout? I'm sorry. <laughs> kind of all over the place. The link, I think you, you guys, they, you sent out a link to everybody signed up, right? So I don't know if this represents the, this is the, the, the recipe. On the second page of the recipe at the bottom, I actually already put it in there. Okay, so remember just to go to that page, second page. I have um, tried to find in your local, um, uh, in, in that when I think of people in California where you can possibly get all these things that I mentioned. So for fresh herbs, you want to go talk to your your local community nurseries. You can find from the grocery store or even uh, I think uh, Home Depot, power stores, Ace. Yeah, they they have a a, a a gardening section. They sell herbs there as well. As far as I can remember, I I, I used to live in San Francisco in the in the Northern California area. Okay, and there are online herb suppliers that I have a list there. Um, there is also some other online essential oil suppliers. And these are these are all online and they some of them has a physical store. I try to find the ones that are more along the west coast. Some I think a couple of them are in Northern California. Uh, but other than that, you can I think I believe even Whole Foods sells essential oils. That you can go and check them out. And but I do want to recommend that you buy from these sources I do trust. And if you compare the prices, finding out that you know ordering them online is sometimes actually cheaper than buying in the physical store. Go ahead and buy from these guys. And uh, the reason why uh, uh, there's another reason for this is that then because these are what these are what the ones that I've used, I know that they are legit. They smell right. They don't dilute or they don't cut with other uh, other oils. Okay, so. Uh, in a way, it's training your nose to know what essential oils should smell like, and it's a it's a learning. It's actually you kind of have have to spend some money to learn how to tell what's a good, uh, good trusted brain. Yeah. Thank you. So I now I know where to start, and the other thing is um it is not easy to find. Yeah. Uh, ethanol alcohol here, and what we can find in pharmacies are isopropyl alcohol, uh, which has a strong and unpleasant smell, or like hand sanitizer gel made from ethanol alcohol, uh, which has less strong smell. So I wonder if mm -hmm. we can make herbs, her, herb hand sanitizer with sanitizer gel or can like essential oil eliminate the strong smell of isopropyl alcohol? Um, okay, okay. Mm. The last question is no. Okay, I know that the uh, isopropyl, okay, I have a trouble pronouncing that word. I, I bought that before it's for, for studying purposes. So for some reason, this is odd. It's so easy to get the rubbing alcohol, just the ethanol alcohol. It still has a, a smell, but not as strong as the isopropyl alcohol. And I do get what you're saying that it's, it's what's the word? It's pungent. It actually kind of stings your nose a little bit. And unfortunately, no essential oil can get rid of that. But that's not to say that it's not, it, it won't work. It will work and it actually it has a very strong um, uh, disinfectant property. What you want to do is you use that, you still do it the way that I did it, follow all the procedure, procedures, but you don't sniff your hand right after you spray it. Because in that case, you actually are breathing in the fumes of the isopropyl alcohol. Okay, and what's the other question? The gel. Yes. Right, the gel. Uh, the gel is made with ethanol, but it's in gel form. That's that's the yes. question, right? Yes. Um, it's made in the gel form. It will also do 
and actually probably nicer because it's in gel form. It's nicer, more friendlier to your 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 skin. Uh, you want to find what? Where do I find a pretend? Okay, empty out the gel into a container or a bowl. Okay, empty it out and then. Do your math. Okay, we want less than 2% of essential oils in your gel. Say you have a bottle, I'm pretending this is a big bowl, and you have a bottle of a 200, I don't know, in the US if you go by the, the pound system, you have ounce. Okay, maybe you have a four ounce bottle, empty all the gel all out into a container, and then do your math. Okay, I would, if, you guys probably need to send me links to ask me how to do the math. Okay, how to do the two percent? Uh, one one mil equals about twenty drops. Okay, like I, so that's why thirty in the thirty mil bottle, I only put six drops. You see how like it's like one percent only, one percent scented spray. Okay, so do your math to de decide how much, uh, how many drops of essential oil you should do in in your your gel. And then take a stirring your, I don't know, in time, we use chopsticks. Chopsticks is, is a very useful tool or your fork and start stirring. Stir and make sure that you mix in the essential oil with the gel very well. And then take your silicone, your scraper and scrape it back into the bottle if you can. I know sometimes the bottle comes with a really narrow tip. That one you might not want to mess with. Okay, but you know, find a way to dump out and dump it back in. And then you have your scented gel. So that answers okay. all the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Can we just um, dip the essential oils into yeah, I, the, I, in the Yes, recipe? but you, you provide that you can make sure that after you drip it in, you can shake and mix very well. Because the last thing I want you to do is you drip it in, you cap it, and then you use it the essential oil is floating on the very top of the container. And when you squirt it out, all the, the essential you just put in come out in that first squirt, and then you're done. Like, you know, there's no essential oils in there anymore. So I don't know how, depending on the, the, the viscosity, the thickness, how, how gooey your gel is. So mm -hmm. I don't know, you, you might need to experiment, shake it really well, or try to, I don't do it, put it upside down. Yeah, I don't know. But make sure that you, you know that it's mixed. Okay. So talking about dose, we all know that um dose is very important. If the dose is too high, it turns toxic mm -hmm. and toxic. Right. And if the dose is too low, it doesn't work. So when we make herbal like hand sanitizer, do we need to use an exact amount like what you showed us? Or like um um, what are tested in the in, in your lab? So can we adjust the amounts of the essential oil according to our preferences? Um, this is a very good question, but I have I don't have the exact you know. There's no I should say there's no textbook standard answer answer to this. There's no perfect dosage because this is uncharted territory. But I do want to say one thing is that, okay, number one, when you do the spray, the in disinfectant spray, the, the spray, we already already know that your alcohol does the job, but we're trying to boost the ability of the alcohol to beat back the virus that you know we have in mind. Uh, having said that, uh, I want to bring your attention to actually in aromatherapy, like I actually mentioned this earlier. You always want to dilute. You don't want pure, neat, 100% pure oil on your skin because it can be uh, irritant to your skin. So it's very powerful. It's very strong in terms of antimicrobial, antiviral, antibacterial activity, but you always want to dilute. So instead of answering, because I don't have an, a, there's no fixed answer to what's the standard dosage. How much would work? We don't actually know, but we do know that it has these um, properties, and we want to play it safe. Before we 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 kill the the virus, we don't want to hurt our skin, break our skin first, right? So, uh, two percent less than for spray, two percent. Unless you're doing it in the in the using this as this um, a mist for your room. 
just to make your room smell nice, then you probably can use a stronger concentration in your spray, but that actually hurts your 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 pocket. So because essential oils are expensive, they're not cheap. But like I said, think back to how much you use. Every time you're using drops of it, not the whole bottle. You don't cash out a bottle in one go. So just make sure that you dilute and you know go buy an aromatherapy book. Or buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, um, so I learned one thing that we need to be careful is that no matter what, don't use more than 2%, right? Yeah, in terms of if you're applying on your skin, especially. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so in the past year, we all wash our hands or um, sanitize our hands frequently and it dry out our, uh, dry out our skin. So can we put anything in a hand sanitizer when we make it to hydrate our skin? Uh, yes, uh, one option is when you make the spray, you add a little bit of glycerin into your bottle, but make sure that you don't dilute the alcohol concentration. So just, um, I don't know, for a 30 ml bottle, you maybe only can put in two mil to five mil of um of glycerin in there and that will leave a kind of a smooth feel on your hand as opposed to drying out uh and you can buy glycerin i believe again in hardware store or pharmacy so go get another shot but sometimes you just more likely that you can't you can't find these things in your local stores um use oil to moisturize your hand. And actually come to think of that, there's one oil, I, if you're going online to buy the essential oils, I highly recommend that you buy um, fractionated coconut oil, not just coconut, but coconut oil works too. Okay, there's a, a, a type of oil that's fractionated coconut oil, which is liquid in any, you know that the coconut oil um, solidifies at cold temperature. So it's hard, hard, harder to use. But if you buy fractionated coconut oil, it contains all the antibacterial, antimicrobial fatty acids in your fractionated coconut oil. Use that to moisturize your hands after you, you have um, spray and clean your hands repeatedly and causing your skin to kind of be flaky and dry and painful sometimes. Um, so that if you go on the, the essential oil supply sto stores, look for the fractionated uh, coconut oil. I recommend that because that maintains your antibacterial ability after you apply the oil on your hands. Thank you. So you mentioned that um, coconut oil also um, works. And yeah. uh, I'm wondering, because not everyone has coconut oil, yeah. but yeah. we all have like um, olive oil or yes. like um, soybean yeah. oil in your kitchen. So will those oils work too? I Actually, any the, any oil works. Okay, so I think I believe it, okay, you guys are mostly I I don't know people who signed up mostly are from the the uh, Northern California or United States or here, but everybody should have a bottle of olive oil. It is super moisturizing. Okay, so any oil would work. And what I, I the reason why I mentioned coconut oil is that because it has this antibacterial properties built in to the oil. So that's the, the reason why I recommend it. But if you don't have it, you don't feel like go out and buy another extra bottle of oil at home, go ahead and use the olive oil at home. And uh, so in your talk, uh, you showed us you showed us how to make herb honey and uh, you leave the 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 herbs, uh, the herbs in the honey, and when you want to use it, uh, you just scoop out a, uh, a scoop of honey and uh, like stir it in water. Mm -hmm. But um, can I like um strain out the herbs of the honey? So when yes, yes. So do you have any tips? But because honey is so sticky, so. It's hard right. for me to imagine how to like yeah, strain yeah. out the, the herbs. Let me try to find what I have on this table. Uh, 
Okay, to strain out your herb, and this is the strainer I have. I, know I was making licorice tea earlier. Um, so what do you want to do? Maybe you want a bigger strainer than this, and maybe not so, I don't know what's the phrase, mesh, not so fine, maybe a little bit coarse, bigger holes, okay. And then you just dump the content into this, filter out all the herbs. The herbs will stay in here. And you were saying that you were right, it's very thick, very, I guess it's viscosity. It's very gooey. So it's hard to imagine how imagine how you can it can filter it out. So this is I was making tea. Okay. Um so honey turns more liquid, more fluid when it's heat up. But in honey, honey has some antibacterial property as well, antimicrobial. But, uh, and this also has some certain really wonderful enzyme in it that's good for your health. So you don't want to destroy that. So what you want to do is you boil a pot of water in a small pot. Okay, not not all the way to boil, maybe like 80, okay, sorry, 80 Celsius. I forgot how, I didn't look up the Fahrenheit, but you guys do the math, okay? So not to boiling, just warm enough. And then you put this jar of honey, herbal honey inside to warm it up just a little bit so that it's more um, runny, easier to filter. And after it's been sitting there, I don't know, um, 30 minutes or so, before it cools down anyway, actually that, that is not a set time, it depends on your room temperature. In winter time, you might want to do it right away. As soon as it heats up, you want to filter it out, so don't let it sit too long. So once it's sitting inside the hot bath, you take it out and then you, you dump it out. It should facilitate the process a little bit uh, faster. And okay, pretend this is the honey that I already filtered out. This is like my tea. Um, so you, you, you will have a, a, a basket, a, a, a filter full of herbs. Uh, I usually don't throw away those herbs. So I put them into my meat marinade because I already have herbs in there. Or I just make a really big jug of uh, honey tea with the remaining, and then I dump the content. Yeah, so don't waste the herbs. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. So, that's that. so thanks for the practical tip. And before my last question, I saw. Mm. Uh, I think I think it's a quick question. Um, oh. Could you explain what is tincture? Oh, you just saw me make it. Tincture is herb or spices for that matter. Okay, actually, I should say, you guys all bake. If you bake, you use va vanilla extract. Vanilla is, va vanilla extract is a tincture. It's vanilla bean. Okay, I don't have the, I have a ton in the pantry. But if you put the, take the vanilla bean, Break it open, scrape out the seeds, and put it again in a in a in a jar, and then fill it with vodka, because you're gonna eat it. So, in that case, you have made vanilla tincture. But just in baking, we all call it vanilla extract. So you can think of tincture as a way to use alcohol. Alcohol is a very good solvent. It extracts. The properties of whatever material you put inside. So this is the tincture. So so the question is I already you asked what is tincture. This is tincture. Put herb in. Uh, pour the alcohol in. Let the alcohol do the job, extracting the medicinal property out of the herb and filter it out. The liquid is your tincture. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it has been eight. Uh, oh, wow. So can we save our last question to like um maybe Claire can answer the question after um yeah yes, you upload the, the video to the YouTube and Claire yeah. we can we can like type the answer of Claire's um under the video right. But thank you today uh, for um, everyone for attending and thank you, Claire and Tin. And uh, the questions that we didn't get to, we will answer uh, at the bottom of uh, the video at the end uh, when we uh, publish it. All right. Thank awesome. you, everyone. Have a good night. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Bye, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.